Thank you very much. Good morning. Beautiful day in Brisbane. Done my 10Ks on the river. And it's amazing how the day can be so different once you run in a beautiful city um, such as this. Uh, one of the reasons I accepted the invitation was I knew if I got my act together, got up early, I could run along the river um, because it really is a beautiful city. Um, a lot of patients come and see me because I do some stuff for the Wiggles, but I must just give a little, a little bit of information. I can't sing and I can't dance. Um, but the story goes um, with the Wiggles is that being a Jewish doctor, I used to work every Christmas at the kids' hospital in Ranwick because I thought it's only fair that those who celebrate Christmas have that time off with their, with their family and their friends. Um, and one of the great things that the Wiggles do and have done for the last 19 years is come to the kids' hospital at Ranwick on Christmas Day, unannounced, with no media and no fanfare. And so one of my roles on that day was to take the Wiggles around to each and every patient to have a photo, uh, to have a, give them a show bag and to do a song. And these are guys that are multi-millionaires, all with their own kids, all with their own families. And it, you know, as an immigrant to this country, I was always incredibly touched about this great Australian group uh, of people. And so Anthony Field, who's, the, who's the, uh, the founder and the lead of the Wiggles, and I have become very good family friends. So much so that my wife now organizes Christmas dinner for the Field family to come to our house, the Jewish family, for Christmas after they've been to the Wiggles, after they've been to the, to, to, to the, uh, to the kids' hospital. Um, unfortunately, for about three or four days afterwards, I'm humming wiggle songs and Christmas songs, which is really quite unusual. But for me, it's an absolute highlight um, of, of the year, and it's one of the things I always look forward to, spending some time and just seeing the cheer on the faces of the kids. Um, for them, this is a memory um, that they'll keep forever, and it's not just the children. Uh, it's the family and the parents, and it's just one of the most rewarding experiences. And they do without fanfare. Uh, without media and out press, and it's a wonderful day. So that, that's the connection to the Wiggles. Um, but parents often come and see me because they know I'm Dr. Johnny from the Wiggles. How that translates into my practice, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I'm from Sydney these days. Obviously, I'm not born in Sydney. I have a slight lilting South African accent, I'm told. Um, how safe is New South Wales Health? Um, and this is something that, that in my role as Director of, of Pediatric Safety is something that I do think about very seriously and it's something that's important to our patients. If you read the Telegraph and the Morning Herald throughout the whole of 2016, you would have thought the system's about to collapse, that it's going from crisis to crisis, from blunder to blunder, the health minister needs to resign, the system is completely falling apart. It's not to say that we don't have adverse events in the health system. It's nice to be, aim to be able to aim for zero, but it's an aim, and things do go wrong. But my biggest problem with the Telegraph, because their role is to sell newspapers, and so they sensationalize everything, is undermines our public confidence in the health system, which is a very, very important thing, and they give scant regard to that, and it's an absolutely critical thing. So what I want to do in the next 15 or so minutes is show you some data, literally fresh data from New South Wales in adult medicine, and also spend a little bit of time at the end on pediatrics to show you how the system is safe. Um, it's crazy that the minister has to resign because of a plumbing problem or because some oncologist goes rogue. So what do I mean by those comments? Last year we had an absolute tragedy. Two children were gassed, um, given, the wrong, given the wrong gas, nitrous instead of oxygen. One of them died, one of them severely brain damaged. And it was a plumbing problem. Um, there was a whole series of events, and I know there's stuff on the Bubbles website around this, a whole series of events, the Swiss cheese model, when all the holes lined up that went wrong and this terrible outcome. But I don't think Gillian Skinner, the minister, was actually the plumber involved. Uh, and, and so it's a long straw to say that she must resign because of that plumbing problem, and it undermines the confidence, because then the community think that there's something wrong everywhere. And unfortunately, someone was fired, and whether that helps, I don't know. And then we had an oncologist in adult medicine who went rogue and did underprescribed, flat dose prescribing for a very important chemotherapy agent. And quite likely some patients died, but it's not exactly a direct comparison. And so everyone, suddenly, my friends and oncologists, suddenly every single patient was questioning him on his prescribing practices. Not that that's a bad thing, but it's a bad thing when patients lose confidence and start asking those questions. So if you read the Telegraph, you think our system's about to collapse. We're a busy, busy place. We have nearly two million admissions. Our average length of stay is about three and a half days, which gives us six and a half million bed days per year. That's excluding outpatient visits. And last year, we had 2.7 million 
visits to our emergency department, some of which you would have looked after. This year, it seems as, all, it seems as if those two and a half million patients have all come to the emergency department in August. Okay. <laughs> if you see the statistics weekly like I do, our influenza rates are unprecedented. We are four times the normal average for August, and August is always by far and away the busiest month. And that is a massive burden on the health system. Last Thursday night, for example, there wasn't a single ICU bed in the state of New South Wales. So it's a precious resource, and we are incredibly busy. Our budget is just under $20 billion for New South Wales. That's not, no other state. That's not GP practice. That's the publicly funded health system. So we're talking about a huge number of patients, 6.5 million bed days. We have about 160 incidents, 160,000 incidents per year, of which about 13,000 are complaints. And those are roughly the same numbers every year, despite rapidly increasing numbers of admissions um, to hospital and bed days. In New South Wales, like many states, we classify incidents using a 1 to 4 scoring system, a severity assessment code, or a SAC score. And of those 6.5 million admissions last year, we had 520 of the most serious incidents, uh, unexpected death or serious medical misadventure. Of those, about 420 of those patients died. So sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes they are predictable. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you have no doubt what happened next. Okay. Probably, not the one, probably not the way you want to do your plumbing in your pool. So when you look at the number of serious incidents, which is 520 last year, and 6.5 million bed days, what you get, I thought it's very funny, 007, no relationship to James Bond, of course. I just thought that's very ironic. But we get 0 0.007. SAC one bed days, SAC one incidents per thousand bed days. And of our second most important um, clinical events or adverse events, we've got 0 0.039 SAC two incidents per thousand bed days. That puts New South Wales Health on a par with the most high functioning, high reliable systems in the NHS, in Boston, in Cleveland, uh, in Cincinnati. So actually, but this is th this is the data. I wish I could write the Telegraph in my capacity and tell them this, because I think our patients have every right to believe that our system is high-functioning, reliable, and confident for the most part, which it is, because of, because of people like our previous speaker and all the frontline clinicians that go to work every day. I don't know anyone who's come to me and said, Johnny, you know, I'm going to work today to do the worst I can for patients. Okay? <laughs> I've never said, no one's ever come to me and said, Johnny, I think I'm a below-average pediatrician. Okay? We actually go to work because we care. We're all smart enough to become investment bankers. And the reason we didn't become investment bankers is because we actually care about patients and their families. And we come to work with that premise. I don't know anyone who comes to work and says, I'm going to do the wrong thing for a patient. They're an incredib incredible group of committed patients. Not in my slides today, but you're all familiar with the terrible Charlie God story in, in, in Great Ormond Street. And my colleagues, because I work very closely with them on patient safety, some of the nurses had to take the uniforms before, off before they left Great Ormond Street because of the abuse they were getting in public, because of the paper running that story. So in New South Wales, every time a SAC1 event happens, there has to be a root cause analysis or an RCA done within 70 days. The chief executive has to commission a team, and that report has to be signed off and given to the Ministry of Health and the Clinical Excellence Commission within 70 days. That may seem like a burden, but the bad news, or the good news, depending on who you ask, is that's about to change because of the events of Bankstown last year. So actually, the number of days required is going to be reduced to 50 from 70 to shorten that. And in fact, what we're going to expect is that if, if a serious significant event happens, the chief executive and the governance unit have to make a decision within 48 hours about what type of issue is at play and what type of investigation has to be had. Because what happens in New South Wales is, and we've had RCAs for about 12 years, is people think that's the solution. Something terrible happens, let's commission an RCA, and that's the, that's the problem solved. There are a few recommendations, most of which are weak, and involve education and policy. Jeez, we don't need any more policies. Someone right now in Miller Street in New South Wales is dreaming up a new policy for us. Okay? <laughs> there are over 950 policies. There's a policy for policies. Okay? Okay? I did not go to medical school to become averse with policies. But if there's, a, if there's a policy, and I know about it, and I continuously disregard it, and something goes wrong, then I have to be answerable to the system. 
And so the no blame culture is not quite right at the moment. There has to be accountability in that culture. So we have too many policies and we rely too heavily on education on a transient workforce. So something seriously goes wrong. For example, the awful case at Bankstown. That district will have 48 hours to make a judgment on what type of investigation they're going to do. Is that going to be an RCA? Is it a performance review? Because too many of our RCAs are actually poor performance, doctored up as system issues. So for example, I was re reviewed a case where a, 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 la a laborer, a, um, a tradie, cut his arm on the work site quite badly and needed plastic surgery and, and uh, started developing some vascular issues with the bleeding artery. And they couldn't get the vascular surgeon to come in. Now, if a vascular surgeon isn't going to come in to save a 23-year-old's arm, what on earth are they doing on call? And the first thing I said about that case, I bet you that's not the first time that they couldn't get that vascular surgeon to come in because there's a pattern of behavior. And for too long in the medical profession, we cover our, we cover our colleagues' asses because we know there's a pattern of poor behavior and about culture. And, and as a famous Australian said, what you walk past is what you accept. And we do that all the time. So we're trying to make sure that even now, despite our system being so safe, that we're, even, we're going to make it safer. And so and it may not be a 70-day RCA. It may be a, a, a one-week performance review around the clinician's behavior or a high-level external review. So last year, we reviewed all these 520 RCAs. I'm very happy to say there is a tiny number in pediatrics. So over half of them are in our general clinical committee and a huge number on mental health. I have a newfound respect for psychiatrists and a, and a great and deep appreciation of the burden of mental health in our society. And I'm embarrassed to say as a pediatrician training and working that I, I probably didn't appreciate that. As I've got older and wiser and work more closely with our chief psychiatrist, I recognize that mental health patients are at a significant disadvantage on almost every respect. Most importantly is those patients are often undernourished, dehydrated, have side effects of medication, no support person, and they come into serious medical misadventure because our system is not set up properly. So if you come into the hospital or the emergency department and you're a mental health patient and you've got a physical comorbidity and you go to the wards, the general wards, they're not going to be too flash at managing your agitation and your aggression and your mental health issues. If you go to one of our mental health units, and bless them, they do the best they can, some of them don't even use between the flags charts. And how are you going to recognize physical deterioration in a mental health patient? So our system's actually set up to have difficulty in managing these type of patients, if you think about it. So small numbers of pediatrics, about 25 RCAs a year. You could ask yourself why that is the case. I personally believe one of the main reasons, coming back to your talk, is that most children come in with carers and family who are the advocates. And it's not always the case in adults. That's obviously a very glib generalization. But I love saying that because of how, how, how much we respect the families in pediatrics. So all of those RCAs come to one of our four committees. We have, we have a general clinical, mental health, children, young persons, and a maternal perinatal committee. Large number of active clinicians and senior leaders. And then we interrogate this information. We try and see what's the principal incident type, what are the system factors, what are the patient factors, what are the human factors at play. It's all very well collecting this information, um, and it's something that we do at the CC, but it's just as important to co communicate back to the front line. So if an incident happens at one hospital, that might be terrible and tragic for that family. But unfortunately, that hospital or that system doesn't have a bird's eye view of the whole system, which is what we do in our roles. So it's key for us to communicate back to the front line around developing trends and issues. So we develop a series of clinical focus reports and safety watches. Those of, those of you who work in New South Wales will be familiar with the pediatric watches, and we've done nine in the last year. So we try and do one set of communications every month on an important topic like sepsis, fluids, medication safety, the importance of a high lactate, whatever we think is going to be important, with the ideas that nurses in the tea room will see those, and JMOs and registrars and consultants will be aware of those. So very much around aggregating the data, because then you get a system-wide approach, and communicating that back to our front lines. This, talk has got, this picture's got nothing to do with my talk, okay? But the reason I put it in is because we're facing an unprecedented obesity crisis. <laughs> this is clearly an American picture because I don't think we make milk by the gallon, and I don't think we make fruit juice by the gallon in this country. Last week in my rooms, I saw an HR holder who was 96 kilos, okay? And that's, that's probably every couple of weeks that I'm seeing that now. And I won't talk long about this, but for, for, for as long as it remains that if you've got $20 and you live in Western Sydney and you're struggling, if you've got $20, it's much cheaper to stop at the... Actually, you don't have to get out the car. Go to the drive-thru 
and get a bucket of KFC or Maccas. You don't even have to get out the car. You can feed the whole family on that bucket of KFC and you'll get five pieces of sushi. That's not going to feed a family of four. And that's our problem in Sydney is that healthy food is much more expensive than cheap food. So this is a time bomb. It's going to affect all of us in, in our career. Nothing related to my talk, of course, but gee, that's, that's a lot of milk. <laughs> so as I've mentioned, only 25 sack ones a year, but we see 200 sack twos in pediatrics. So I'm going to show you one or two slides on our SAC1 data, and then I want to spend the rest of the talk looking at our SAC2 data. So the top risk factors, and this is repeated if I showed you data from before that, from 13 and 12, 11. Deteriorating patient, failure to recognize a deteriorating patient, and failure to respond to deteriorating patient. Altering calling criteria are the number three, are the number one, two, and three in almost every chart that I can show you. And number four is sepsis. And it was interesting that you made a comment. It's still hard. Even for senior pediatricians like myself, you get 100 viremic patients into your ED. How do you pick the three that have got meningococcemia or, or, or sepsis as opposed to 97 that have got flu A and flu B? And that's really hard. So we're not very good, particularly our junior staff, at pick, picking sepsis. And that comes through time and time again. What about by LHD? And I reckon my friends at the Telegraph would absolutely love this slide because the first thing they would say is some of those systems are incredibly safe. They hardly have any adverse reports. And I would say the opposite is true because we know at the Clinical Excellence Commission that some districts have a culture of reporting and some districts don't. So we have to interpret this type of data with caution because just because you're reporting more doesn't mean that you're unsafe, unreliable. It might be the exact opposite. You may have a very good culture of reporting, and, and, and so all, all the stuff is entered into our incident management system and, and managed. Or you may not. And so it's very important because most lay people wouldn't understand this, this, this uh, contradiction. So I want to spend just a minute on this slide because this blew me away. I thought because most of the patients in, in, in a pediatric facility or a children's hospital are under one, generally about 40% on, on any one day, most of the incidents would be happening in that age group, and I'm wrong. We have a massive problem with mental health patients in our system, adolescents, and it's something that we're not really taking seriously. So if you look at our data from the last few years, you can see the spike in 12 to 16-year-olds and 15 to 16-year-olds in our system. And that's around aggression, absconding, drug error in our, med in our mental health adolescent patients. So quite striking compared to the, the younger patients in our system. Where do the incidents happen? This is looking at our SAC2 data. So again, not surprising to me, most of the serious incidents happen where most of the complex patients are cared for, which is in a tertiary hospital, and then a smaller number happen in our metropolitan hospitals, even smaller numbers um, in our rural hospitals. We are seeing more stuff to do with retrieval. I think that is something we haven't really explored properly around, uh, around reliability and retrieval. Where about in the hospital do most things happen? And again, this wouldn't be a surprise to any of you. Most of the stuff happens in the, in the, in the kids' ward. That's where most of the care happens. Secondly, in the emergency department, particularly in, 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 uh, in the care of children. Mental health service, number three, just re-emphasizing you know, re the point that this is a significant burden for care. Sorry, this is, a, this is a very busy slide, but really what I wanted to show you, this is our principal incident types. So we've taken our SAC2 data, We've interrogated it, analyzed it, and said, what are the most important principal incident types? And of the top six or so, I hope that projects, of the top six or so, almost, I think almost all of them are mental health. So again, mental health self-harm, mental health absconding, misdiagnosis is important, medication, and then a whole lot of other, other issues. So mental health, even in our sac 2s in pediatrics, is coming through very strongly, consistently, over the last three years. What about risk factors? So this is again looking at our RCAs, our highest level issues. Failure to recognize last year, failure to respond, and sepsis, altering calling criteria. The exact same stuff that I showed you from the previous two to three years. So we need to do something about this, and we need to do something about sepsis. I believe that's our single biggest priority in pediatrics, um, because if you miss a case of sepsis, that can have, besides a child dying, and the impact on the family and the parents and the siblings, it's a massive financial burden. So we're about to undertake a pediatric sepsis collaborative, a national collaborative. Um, and we're currently in the enrollment phase, 20 to 30 hospitals across, across the country. The CEC is partnering with Children's Hospital Australasia, and we're going to be the, the national lead. Um, and we're working very closely with IPSO, which is improving pediatric sepsis outcomes in the US. They're in their third wave of the collaborative, and they've got 60 hospitals enrolled. And they've reduced in-hospital mortality for, of, of sepsis from 11% to 3%, which I think is pretty impressive. 
So we can learn from, from the Americans um, around developing a care bundle. And that care bundle, while not finalized because we're still convening the expert committee, um, which will meet next month, will almost certainly look around oxygen, blood culture, lactate, early administration of antibiotics, broad spectrum within an hour, appropriate use of fluids, and senior clinical review at any point. Because we reckon with sepsis, you need people who've seen the signs and know how to pick them. Because we don't want to overuse fluids and antibiotics, but we want to use them in a targeted way quickly. So we're launching that next month. It's based on the Sepsis Kills program, which is Recognize, Resuscitate, Refer. And because my time's up, my final slide, my mentor, the most famous pediatrician on the planet, the previous chief executive of Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and I was very fortunate to spend a year in Boston, Don Berwick. If you remember nothing else from my talk today, please remember these words when you go back and see patients. In the words of Don, don't kill me, don't harm me, do things that help, relieve my pain, Share your information with me and don't make me wait. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great morning. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, again, Twitter has been having some significant response. A lot of people actually just agreeing with everything that you're saying. I'll let Nikki um, mention yeah, so, a few uh, things. There's been a real lot of excitement that Dr. Johnny from the Wiggles is here. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you could go online, there are some, some really good tweets on that. Um, but may, maybe they've only tweeted them because they know you're not there. I don't know. And then there was... Kat Evans from South Africa said that mental health patients are probably the most disadvantaged and neglected. Uh, the system's set up for failure, and it's the same back at home. Do you know of any country in the world which is winning with this and that we could use as a role model? It's a very tough question. Um, I think some of the high-performing health systems in the US, so places where I've been, um, like Children's Boston and Mayo, are starting to understand the importance of having a holistic approach to, to, to children, adolescents with mental health in an adolescent environment with appropriately staffed professionals and looking after both the physical and the mental health issues simultaneously. Because as, as I said, I think where we fail is you come to an emergency department and the system says to us, within four hours, make a decision about where this patient's going to go. And is that a physical, is that a general ward? And we might not look after the mental health issues, or is it to the mental health unit where the staff are not very skilled at looking at physical deterioration? Um, so I think we have to have some sort of holistic approach. We have to have a complete rethink. And the pressure on the emergency departments to make that decision in four hours is extremely complicated, particularly when you're talking about an agitated 15-year-old. It's just not something you can do. And so these kids often languish in an emergency department for 24 hours, and that's inappropriate as well. So I think we have to have a completely rethink from the moment the children arrive, our interaction with the pediatric staff, emergency staff, a, a child, and mental, mental, child and adolescent mental health professionals, and a psychiatrist. We have to have a rethink about this journey because we haven't set up the system correctly. In fact, we've set it up deliberately to get the outcomes we have. It's, it's, it, it's, it's completely wrong. And um, Aidan Barron has asked, us doctors hate their mandated sepsis bundles because they are not current. How will Australians keep practice updated? So one of the things we're doing with our sepsis collaborative is actually um, next month in Sydney there's a, uh, an expert panel from across the country and from New Zealand. So New Zealand are participating in our sepsis collaborative and we've chosen 15 of the top uh, experts from ICU, emergency, um, antimicrobial stewardship to come together and actually look at the current evidence and try and work out what's, what's, uh, what, what, what the latest evidence is telling us and how we design a bundle. It's, there's two parts to this. The first part is how you recognize, which is no easy feat. We, rec we realize that it's not so easy to pick that kid that's bacteremic or septic amongst all the other viremic flu kids and bronchiolytics that come to ED. So how do we make, how do we make uh, the most sensitive tools in recognizing which, which kids are septic or may become septic? And then how do we work out a bundle uh, reliable response? That means they get the best treatment with evidence. So it's very exciting, and I don't have the answer today, but it's something we're going to be working with through the collaborative over the next 18 months, together with, obviously, our expert panel. And then a final question, if I may. Jane Cox has asked, SAC 1 and 2 events are serious according to the clinicians, but what do parents and their families think are serious events? Well, I think the first thing is they hope it doesn't happen to their family. Um, the numbers are small, but if it happens to that family, it's a total disaster. So even though we talk about 25 RCAs a year, and I say that's a tiny number, I recognize that that's 25 families that are significantly impacted by a serious adver adverse event or an unexpected death. And we don't mean, mean to minimalize that. 
So um, what families want, when we talk about open disclosure, they all want the same thing in my experience. They want you to say sorry. I'm sorry I didn't get the cannula in. I'm sorry that happened. Um, what are we going to do about it? And how are we going to prevent the same thing happening to a family? That's almost always the theme of every high-level open disclosure that I've attended. Say you're sorry. What's the investigation going to entail? How are you going to prevent it happening again? I think most families are pretty sensible. They understand that medicine is complex. There are a lot of moving parts, and it involves things called humans. Uh, we sometimes make mistakes. We, we have to be humble enough to recognize that. Yeah. But if something happens, we have to be robust enough as a system to try and find out what the cause was and try and develop a system that's going to be more robust in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnny, for sharing that with us this morning. Thank <laughs> you.